to Peter for inviting me to give this talk. This is actually uh, uh, one of the first times uh, that I have had that I have this occasion to like present a gigantic overview of uh, what has been done on uh, liquid metal batteries. So this resulted in a, a long night of work uh, with much too many slides produced that I probably won't be able to show. But uh, nevertheless, let us start. Uh, this seems to be blocked. Okay. So liquid metal batteries, so it's early in the morning. Let's try to remember what it is. You've probably seen this, but this is a cartoon that I often use. People immediately understand what it is. It's three layers of different densities stacked on top of each other. And when we do that with particular choices of metals and alloys and particular choices of uh, molten salts, we can create a battery. So um, this is a, a cut of a, of a, of a previous uh, liquid metal battery and um, uh, you can uh, do that I got from this article by uh, your, your first PhD student. So the idea was that the cells are self-assembling, they have indeed a long lifetime, so now we see that because we have uh, so many cycled uh, uh, batteries already. They are high temperature, they can be made with earth abundant metals, uh, materials, and they exist. Uh, this is a picture that I found a while ago on, uh, on the website of AMBU. So, uh, like, um, this is a very heterogeneous uh, community. And so, let me recall to you the basic LMB chemistry for physicists. So, on top we have a good conductor, uh, on, on the bottom we have a good conductor. These are orders of magnitude. And in the middle we have a molten salt electrolyte with a much lower conductivity. Why is that so low? Because the charges uh, that transport current, it's uh, ions, it's not electrons. So. How does it work? Well, actually, you have a, a light metal that enters the salt through this reaction uh, during discharge. The, the iron will be taking, will be on the side of the electrolyte. They will move, and for example, the electron will go to the external circuit and make this loop, while the iron will go in that direction, and you will have them both together again. So at that place, we have electrical currents, and this allows you to understand the minus and the plus of the battery. Now, the ions enter into the alloy, and what happens is that at that moment, chemical potential energy is liberated, and this defines the cell potential. It is very difficult to calculate. Now, you can all reverse everything, and uh, then you will have a charging battery, and uh, when you do it in cycles, well, you create these systems that are useful for uh, energy uh, storage. Now, um, Liquid metal batteries, they work because we have these reversible reactions on the interfaces and real difficulty is in finding good material combinations. Um, typical values that you need to keep in mind is current density is limited. We cannot exchange as much uh, current uh, charges as we want to. It's typically, this value is really like something which is the present maximum. Probably you can go beyond that with a very specific battery, but we use that as a typical value uh, for the current density. And typical values for the electrical potential are around one volt. So in actual operation, when you, have a, when you use the battery, well, you, 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 you actually will not have these values always. Because you have Joule losses inside the electrolyte, this is a bad conductor, the yellow layer, you will have uh, an internal resistance and it will lower your potential that you can deliver. So if you draw too much current, you will lose your potential just because of that uh, ohmic uh, losses. And there is also mass transfer over potentials due to inhomogeneity in the alloy, and I will come back to that later. <coughs> now, small and large liquid metal batteries. So at this moment, uh, prototypes, they are small. Uh, I would say centimeter, uh, decimeter. But the idea that we could make like a giant battery was and I changed this word into world. <laughs> Very exciting to us MHD experts. So this is, for example, one too simple sketch of a big battery. It's like small house with electrodes and then three layers. And um, this would be like a, a one too simple sketch of a giant battery, which would be like what you have in an aluminum reduction factory. They are all types of cells which are on a giant current loop. And it just, they're all just in series. 
So as we discussed yesterday, we are not yet there, and probably we will never get there. But nevertheless, I think that the story of a small decade of flow-related studies in liquid metal batteries is worth to tell, and this is the occasion. So why do and did we study flows inside liquid metal batteries? Well, first of all, in the beginning, we said, ooh, we know nothing about the system, but imagine a short circuit, it will explode. Donc, uh, yeah, this was the first generation of studies. We, want, we wanted to study flows because we wanted to avoid these short circuits. In the second generation of studies, later, we said, oh, perhaps flows, we can rather use them. And in the bottom layer, you get an alloy, and an alloy is something that changes in composition. So you want to mix that alloy. I will better explain why. This is a second generation of studies, and we also have a third generation of studies, which is a bit different. Now, there are many different types of flows that we have studied. First of all, we had the Taylor instability, and this was covered in detail yesterday by uh, Frank. We, of course, have thermal convection. This is like heat, 500 degrees. You have a, a big resistor inside the battery. Um, we have metal pad wall instability, possibly. We imagined that it would have also electrovortex flows. And uh, we also discovered that mass transfer was something that was not really negligible. And then we have uh, done uh, about it, but there are things that follow that. Now, this talk is a review of mainly numerical work on these different flows. Uh, what, is, uh, what, is the, what has been done in terms of numerical simulations for liquid metal batteries? Well, let us first remember uh, what liquid metal batteries are really like. They are very multi-phase. First of all, we have three liquid layers, and they are separated by moving interfaces that are immiscible. Um, there's actually a weak mass transport through these interfaces, so in some sense they are permeable, and this is because chemical reactions are going on. Once, you, if you're discharging your battery, you're consuming the top layer, and so everything moves very slowly at the rate of some micrometers per second. We don't model that; we just say at some so in fluid mechanics, we just keep the layers at the same, uh, the same thickness most of the time. So they're also very multi-physical. We have MHD. What this means is that you have three different densities, three different velocity fields, three different current densities, three different magnetic fields, three different temperature distributions. When you're interested in alloy dynamics, you have on the bottom, you need to keep trace of uh, the mass concentration of the light species in the alloy. And when you add on to that electrochemistry, there are many, many, many other fields to add. So it's a really multi-physical problem. And it's also a multi-parameter problem. We have geometry, different layers, uh, cell, uh, heights of the layers, different cell sizes, densities, conductivities, viscosities, uh, uh, thermal uh, diffusion coefficients, binary diffusion coefficients, current density, imposed magnetic field, expansion coefficients, and this is just everything physical. If you add electrochemistry, there's more and more and more. So this needs non-standard solvers to be able to simulate what is going on, and also, very importantly, need to get access to all these material properties. It's not so simple. Now, this is what has been, I probably forgot some of them. But this is like a, a, a quick overview of what has been done in the last decade on different type of flows and different type of simulations. So I exclude here experiments because otherwise I had, would have to use a very small uh, letter type and you would not be able to read anything off. So what do we see in the different colors? We see um, uh, Taylor instability, thermal convection, electrovortex flow, mass transfer, electrochemistry, and there's, there's, there's a chronology in there. And uh, this is also how things evolve. So next to this direct numerical simulation, we have also a small amount of nonlinear shallow models, mainly designed for the metal pad roll instability, and um, they are also nonlinear, but we can't call them DNS. And I will focus mainly on DNS. Now, there are different groups and different solvers, and as you've seen, uh, the Dresden uh, group um, is very active in this area. So uh, they have developed 
uh, the, uh, and using the code open probe, which is a finite volume code, it can do mono and multi-phase, it resolves quasi-static MHD, um, uh, it, that is for low magnetic rayon numbers flows, it can solve temperature, mass transfer, electrochemistry, and probably many other things. And it's really the most popular and versatile solver that we presently have in this community. On our side, um, which is a much smaller group, um, we have uh, three months. And three months, I put my name in the first place here because I'm talking, but actually I'm not really developing this code. It's so complex that we work together with very good numericians, which are Jean-Luc Guillermont, Lou Caponara, and also Caroline, um, and also Sabrina, uh, because it, it's been a project that has been developed since 2005. It is a finite, uh, it is a solver that is for axisymmetric fluid domains, uses finite elements in the meridional planes in Fourier and along the azimuths. It can do mono and multiphase. We do it in full MHD. It can also have temperature and it can also model alloy dynamics and model mass transfer. So this solver is really something which is not open. It's a very precise academic solver, massively paradised but unforgiving. Unforgiving, which means that if you have any lack of resolution, it will just uh, blow up. So in some sense, this is a very protected code, but it's not so versatile as a result. Now, there are other groups uh, which uh, have less contributed, but still contributed. Um, this is um, uh, the group of Oleg Zikanov in Michigan. You have a, a new group uh, in, uh, in Australia. And um, you also have Peter, who also use all these old people use OpenProm, and Oleg he also developed the finite difference code in the beginning to study this uh, thermal convection. Now, what are the questions and what is our methodology in uh, this uh, domain? By all simulation, they were guided by one or more questions in this list: which flows in which batteries, and how do different flow types compete? Can we estimate their intensity? Can we do scaling laws? Can they create short circuits and when? So we can combine some complex some simulations with basic physics. Um, can we use the flows to bend the alloys? Uh, well, again, the same thing. Can we extrapolate something useful to real batteries? Uh, well, it depends what real means. Um, order of magnitude to do, worst case scenarios, that's something that we try to do. And can we simulate electrochemistry, which is, I call, the end of MHD? So there are limits of uh, the, the DNS to be kept in mind. And um, direct numerical simulation, they can provide answers, but they need to be well resolved. And in DNS, this essentially means that Reynolds numbers or Peclet numbers, they should not be too large. So I would say this is a very, uh, no, I, I prefer this is one value that I give, but we probably can go way ahead or not. Uh, but I would say that in our experience, Reynolds numbers of 10 to the power fourth is typically large value for an expensive 3D computation. Now, let us put some numbers to that because we all like non-dimensional numbers, but let us try to put some viscosities there which are realistic. So this is, this is a very low values. Um, what does that mean? DNS, we can simulate flows, weak flows in large cells. We can also simulate gentle flows in small cells, centimeter scale. But we cannot always simulate for a very long physical time. Now, the common tricks, you all, everybody knows them. It's supposed axis symmetry. Okay, this is a one direction less. We can focus on very small cells or do weak flows or integrate not so long. We can use nonlinear shallow models to filter small scales. We can non-dimensionalize and hide behind these numbers all these limitations. So this is a wink-wink to the dynamo community because uh, you all know the very famous viscously dominated Earth-like dynamos. Try to put a number to the Reynolds numbers you have in your simulations. We all have done that, but this is Earth of 20 centimeters. So well, about, uh, after this, uh, short statements, let me now go through the different flow types. Now, Taylor instability, I probably go a bit quicker because we had a, a, a very good introduction of, uh, to this by, 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 by uh, Frank. But 
I really think it's important to start with that because first of all, in my view, it's the MHD instability that is the most, that has the most minimal base state. You just take a conductor and throw current through. That's it. Uh, you cannot go much simpler than that. And uh, what you will have is that beyond the critical Hartmann number, this thing will become unstable. So if you have a, like a plasma uh, flux tube, you, it will be able to deform and you will get this, uh, this, this type of hose uh, instability. So the, 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 the whole system gets wrecked and you can see some kind of flow which is going to uh, make this deformation. But when you have a bounded flow, in like a liquid metal, but you cannot deform the walls. And so this will result in a flow of m equal one rho. Now, when you do linear theory at low magnetic Reynolds number um, for liquid metals, you get Hartmann numbers, which are typically some ab something above 20. Um, and the Hartmann number I, I wrote is in terms of the current density. You have the conductivity, the density, the viscosity there, but well, it's about 20. And this is for the optimal vertical wavelength, for the, for the best, most unstable mode. Now, if you put in typical conductivity, density, and viscosity in liquid metals, you get something like one to two kiloamps, typically, sometimes more, sometimes a bit less, approximately, for this optimal situation. And as shown yesterday by Frank, this, uh, an experiment was actually built to, to, to try to find this instability, and it was found. Now, Considering that moment where we were at that stage, when you see these liquid metal batteries, imagine them big, uh, you can easily say, okay, if you have a cell of a few meters, we will have gigantic currents going through. Uh, we can probably have those instabilities. So if you put numbers with typical value of current density, typical value of the current, critical current, you can compute instability if current is higher than current critical currents, well, you just have a radius of cell, which would be something like uh, 25 centimeters. So it's not so, it's not so big actually. So if you were, we were imagining things very big at the time. So of course, you take a large battery, few meters would be very far above this threshold, would be very unstable. I think it's a plausible thing to think at that time. And this pushed uh, Frank, to write this article and say, okay, we have a big problem, so potentially, so we need a solution. And so the solution was, well, we can avoid this instability by returning the current by a central rod. Okay, so now um, let me come to the simulations of Norber. So Norber, he, uh, he's very present in this community, but um, he did his PhD on this subject. Um, and this was motivated by this idea that failure instability could be very important in batteries. So uh, they decided to do DNS on this failure instability in liquid metals was not done before. And it required a specific development of the open foam coat of the solver as explained yesterday by Frank. You also need the magnetic field, which explains why you have to have a bio Savar solver to find it. Now, Norbert did many contributions, um, but uh, on this topic, we have three articles and uh, on cuboid cells, on cuboid and cylinders, and then in the, uh, a third paper with uh, solid electrodes and their, their effect on the instability and their effect, the competition with the electrovortex rope. No, I will go quickly through this because we saw it yesterday, but I think that one of the most important results of this first article was this one, is that Actually, the, the, the critical current of the cell depends a lot on the aspect ratio. Of course, the, earlier on, I was talking about the optimal wavelength, but you need the optimal box to get that. If you make it flat, it will drive up the, 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 current, the critical current to extremely high values. So it's, if you take, imagine a large scale cell, it will have to be shallow, and shallow cells will be not so unstable. So typically, this, this means, this already suggests that um, failure instability would only be possible in much larger cells than initially estimated. So later on, uh, they continued, and this is what I think the most important result of that article, the one that I like most, um, is that what are simulations useful, really? Linear instability, but linear instability, no. 
we can also estimate the amplitude of the flows because that's also what we want to know. How intense is this flow going to be? Not only when it will occur. And so Norbert was able to measure the scaling now that the Reynolds number goes like Harman squared. So I really like non-dimensional numbers, but I really think that we should also may better interpret what these scaling laws means. Is this really the simplest scaling law? Really, really, Re Re Reynolds goes like Hartmann squared? People interpret it as follows. The flow intensity can become immensely large for big Hartmann number. Let's plug in what the definitions are. You see on both sides the, Hart the, the Reynolds number and the Hartmann number squared, and you see the viscosity on both sides just vanishes. This just tells you that the true flow scale, flow scale is not at all related to viscosity. It's just going to saturate at that amplitude. And I think that is much more informative than saying that Reynolds goes like Hartmann squared. So in his third article, um, Norber, he opened up towards electrophoric flow. I will come back to that more in detail. But what is the idea is that, well, bring, you have to bring the current in some way to these liquid metal regions. And so you, you, you make, you can make these connectors big or small. And the result is that you have diverging current lines. The result is that you have non-zero Lorentz forces and you have this type of jets that are blowing away from the electrodes. So he studied the competition and interplay with Taylor instability to find that it actually overpowers Taylor instability. Now we have also done um, simulations on this um, in, and actually, um, we were really motivated to see uh, something new, uh, some applied MHD in, in this dynamo community because previously uh, I worked there, Caroline worked there, and it was refreshing to see something else with new uh, things. And we said, okay, we have a code, let's try to do uh, something more applied, not only very fundamental dynamo science, um, and multi-phase MHD, that looks fun. So um, this also is an expertise of Jean-Luc Guermont, um, he, uh, this multi-phase methods. And so he transformed, we, Loic Capenara, uh, basically, Caroline and Jean-Luc, transformed the code into a multi-phase MHD code. So there are not too much codes that can do this. It's full MHD with multi-phase. So you can do uh, blobs of liquid metal and dynamo therein. Now, um, we did the, uh, with this code, we did the first multi-phase simulations of uh, LMB, liquid metal battery-like setup. So Taylor instability is first going to happen in the top layer. We already knew that because the density is lower, the Hartmann number is higher uh, for the same current. So we, did, we, were, we were not, uh, uh, this is not entirely unexpected. And we could see interface deformation in our codes, but only when we used very, very low gravity. So we initially we put the real gravity, you just see nothing. This just means that the flow is not very intense. It cannot, it cannot deform the layer. But we had to like reduce gravity by a factor 100 or more. And then you could start to see this uh, short circuit happening. And we just thought, okay, um, well, um, let's try to understand that. So in this article, we did some theory. We will not go into the big detail of that, but it's a linear stability theory. And the idea is that, well, I already showed you uh, this scaling for the flow, but for the growth rate, it's the same. You really don't have to put anything uh, arbitrary there. So people often use like viscous time units, other time units. Well, there's a good time unit to choose. And when you choose that good time unit, your, your non-dimensional growth rate, it will just saturate to some level because you're at the right time scale. So we found that and, for, and uh, from this theory, we just said, okay, this is a M equal one mode. How can it saturate? Well, M equal one modes, they cannot, uh, they cannot make saturate themselves through the nonlinear term U grad U. Uh, because M one times M one, well, uh, this will create M two modes and M zero modes, harmonics. So this means that you need to go to third order interactions. Um, when the flow, the wave, and when the, when the base, when the, when the uh, Taylor mode interacts with it harmonics. And in fact, this is just like a weakly nonlinear saturation scenario where you have growth rate times non-dimensional amplitude goes like a cubic nonlinear term. And this gives you an estimate of 
the non-dimensional growth rate, uh, amplitude of the flow, and you can just find the scaling law that I get and relate that to the linear stability theory. So you have this, if you can do linear stability theory, you can estimate the scale of the flow that is occurring in this system. And this gives you this right scaling law. And then we added some other simple physics. The simple physics is, when can we pinch the electrolyte layer? Well, when it has enough intensity to, to reach through a heavier layer. So this is very basic physics that already was explained yesterday. So with that, we were able to produce this graph. And um, this, was, this, this allowed us to see that even in the worst case scenario, not considering any uh, effect of like uh, shallow that drives up the, um, the, the, the Taylor instability threshold, even without considering all that, um, well, you could estimate that Taylor instability could be possible a risk to pinch the electrolyte in very large cells. All right. So this was the, 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 there were physical ideas in here that we recycled everywhere in the following studies. So my conclusions on cellular instability are the following. It initially looked probably problematic, but not really. Uh, large scale cells may be very shallow, so this results in large instability thresholds. And even in the worst case scenario, we won't pinch the electrolyte layer. So if you use present day limitations on current densities, Taylor instability would not be so dangerous, but it did spark a subsequent amount of other MHD studies on liquid metal batteries. So this was the start, and it's important to remember, and it's why I do this. Now, thermal convection. Thermal convection is the thing that everybody thinks about. It's heat, it will drive flow. Okay, so what is thermal convection? Now, of course, everybody knows what thermal convection is. So, but in liquid metal batteries, you can imagine different sources of heat. So this can be external heating, there can be internal heating, they can be heating by chemical reactions, and they can be heating by phase changes. This is mainly like uh, the work of Paolo Pesronetas, who listed all this. And uh, well, he, it's just important to list them once and then know, okay, this one is the most important. Now, um, first one to make an article on, uh, on, on uh, thermal convection is uh, Oleg Zikanov. So uh, he did uh, um, a DNS of a thermal convection in three layer system finite difference, non-deformable interfaces, so not multi-phase, quasi-static MHD, and cylinders. So he uses a Bolshinesk model, and you have internal heating in the, in the middle layer due to this uh, Joule dissipation. And this, this is a typical base state temperature. You have a parabolic profile inside the, uh, the phase where you have constant heat generation. This is for uh, constant current density. So in the other layers, you are mainly convective, uh, conductive and this creates linear profiles. So you can create a weak flow, but it's also one that will always be present. Now let us put some numbers. In convection, you have like a maximal scale. Uh, and this is like the maximal scale. Your flow will be smaller than the free fall velocity. So you have a beta delta T, which is the relative density change caused by temperature fluctuation. GH, well, the, the, height, is the height of the layer. Um, so let's put some numbers. I don't know what to put there. Let's take small number, 1%, 10 for G and 10 centimeters for height. Well, you get something like centimeters per second maximally. Seems not such a bad number, but in simulations we are way, way below that actually, most of the time. So this will obviously create very weak interface uh, deformations and they really can be ignored. So if we take the scales and we plug them into this law, we can estimate how much they will deform the interfaces and it's micrometers. So it's a very good hypothesis to do non-deformable interfaces. And in Oleg's work, he included the Lorentz force, but uh, I, there are two terms that you should include. But he, he didn't put that one. It's no problem because anyway, MHD doesn't really matter in these simulations, but it's interesting to know why. It's, it's just because it's a complex term, you need to compute the magnetic field. So that's why Norber had to develop this code. So it's not there, it's not said, but anyway, it's not, it's not a problem. Weak Lorentz force, it plays no role. So we also have these correlation laws uh, for heat exchange. And these are typical plots that we already saw yesterday. Um, so um, it gives you a profile of the type and, and an estimate of the typical velocity that you can have. Now, 
This was continued by um, uh, by uh, by Kerner, um, who did a simulation. That those uh, those people are really like convection experts, and they did uh, they added Marangoni effect, thermal Marangoni effect, so surface tension, which is changing also with um, with temperature, participating in convection, and they get different type of flow. But I would say this is also a weak flow. You can recover scaling laws, you can recover correlation laws for heat exchange, which can all also be interesting. Um, Paolo, as I said, he did a detailed presentation of uh, all possible sources of heat. There's no Marangoni, there's no MHD, but he compared in 2D two different solvers, and that's also nice. Uh, it's a true spectral code versus open foam, so as a validation, it's not too bad. What you have there is a base state that's, that's a bit more complex. You can have uh, sometimes uh, even stable stratifications in the, in, uh, in, in, in the top layer, uh, et cetera. So it depends really on, on what you have as uh, heat generated uh, to these reactions, for example. Um, so he studied this type of uh, more complex uh, base states, and he did uh, simulations also in 3D with open foam. And as you see, we get a typical estimate of a few millimeters per second for flow. Now, there are three other articles that also consider thermal convection, but all in combination with electrovortex flows, and I will talk about that later. Now, my conclusion on thermal convection is, it certainly is always present, but don't expect a very intense flow, in particular when you have thin electrolyte layers. But it's the main driver of differences in temperature, so if you take a very thin layer, it won't create much heat. So, I try to estimate this scale of velocity, we often see much lower flows in most simulations. Um, it's useful to have this in mind. And convective flows, they will really never create electrolyte pinches, simply because the differences in density that you can create through temperature are way lower than the differences in densities that you will have between one layer and the second one. So you, you, you just cannot uh, create a very big interface deformation. Now, probably, all this means that thermal convection will be overpowered by other flows if there are other flows. And so there are. We can imagine other flows. So this brings me to my third instability, uh, my third phenomenon, which is a pure MHD phenomenon. Do I go too quickly or can you follow? It's okay. Metal pad roll instability. So what is metal pad roll instability? Well, I, I think that many people know what it is, but. Um, let me recall what it is and where it is seen. So here you have like a, a picture of a typical aluminium factory with hole reduction cells. And so let us look at one hole hero cell. So current is coming from this line. It's injected at the top, going through the, bat through the cell and returning through these bars. And then it goes to the next cell. So this is like what, uh, wh what one system is like. Now, if you look in the inside, you have two layers of uh, liquid, like a cryolite, which acts as a, as a salt. Um, it dissolves the alumina and lowers the temperature uh, where you can reduce to 1,000 degrees, which is much less than what you can do from direct alumina, from melting that. So um, it is very shallow, like five, five centimeters of cryolite. This is a very bad conductor. 30 centimeters of aluminum or more. And then wide extends along X and Y. And all the, all, the, all the current is indexed through carbon anodes that are gradually consumed. They burn down, they get uh, transformed in carbon dioxide, and the oxide comes from the alumina. So um, what is metal pad roll instability? Well, you can get waves on these interfaces, and if you have five centimeters of cryolite, five centimeters is not big, you can have a risk of short circuit, and it's really a problem in this industry because these carbon blocks that are there, if you have a short circuit, they will immediately put all the current through one of these things. And notice this is like 300 kiloamps that go through the cell. If you have it all con concentrated at one place, you just burn down this carbon anode. And it's problematic. Why? But you need to change it. You need to stop the process, get it out, and, ge and get a new one in and restart. So your whole industrial uh, efficiency is, is gone. So that's why we had a huge amount of research on that topic. 
And so the research focused on what is the physical origin of these waves. Now, it's not very difficult to see that with such a huge electrical current of several hundreds of kiloamps, you will just get induction. Just use the right hand rule, put your hand on the, on the red line, and you will have a, a magnetic field inside the factory. And when you have currents and magnetic fields, you have Lorentz force, and then typically you have a weak magnetic field, but it's ambient. It's, this, it's not generated inside the cell, it's uh, generated by the lines next to it. Typically, we have a few millitesla dong several times above the earth magnetic field. Now, I will quickly present this because it's essential, but Caroline will go more in detail through this. The instability mechanism. Let's take a, let's take a cell which is flat, uh, initially at rest. You, you, do, you draw a perfectly homogeneous current towards that, through these layers. So if you uh, will incline, we have a wave, you will immediately redistribute currents because the, the yellow layer is such a bad conductor. You put more current through the shallower parts because it has less ohmic resistance. And so if you focus on the current excess, the plus that you have with respect to the base state, it will loop like that. Intensify at the right and uh, make it smaller, make the total current smaller to the left. So it's horizontal in the aluminum, and remember, this is a very shallow system. So if you take now a, a vertical magnetic field, you can create a Lorentz force, which is transverse, and this will displace liquid, and you will have a wave, which is rotated. So this process is like continuous. You can do that at any position, and you will get an amplified rotating wave. Everything just repeats, and this uh, topic was immensely studied because um, in practice, when you, uh, you in, in practice in the cells, they release the anodes into the liquid, and uh, when they reach a certain depth inside the cryolite, they see a movement going on, and they just withdraw the anodes. So they want to have like, they control passively the instability by taking a minimal cryolite thickness. But this is also creating a lot of ohmic resistance, a lot of heat, and actually alum industry is consuming approximately 3% of the world's electricity because of that. So it's very cheap, but it's actually quite surprising that it's so cheap. So people have tried to find uh, strategies to avoid that, to control that, to describe that. So we have this huge literature on this subject, which is very incomplete. Now, metal pad rolling in, in liquid metal batteries. Well, we all thought that reduction cells would not be so different from uh, liquid metal batteries. So two layers, three layers. Simple, all you need is this small current loop and some external magnetic field. So you, you, you can easily imagine that you have all the same things inside the battery. Your, uh, your current uh, uh, loop will just be a bit different and you will have Lorentz force in both top and bottom layers that can drive these waves. So well, that's all we need. Um, and so people were very motivated about that. And this possibility was already mentioned in your article, Frank, in 2011. So the first model that was developed was a, uh, an extension of a mechanical analog model, which was originally proposed by Peter uh, a while ago. Um, but it was an extension to two slabs, two solid slabs which were interacting electromagnetically. So this, this demonstrates the possibility. And then we had all the people that did shallow models for metal pad roll in reduction cells. They all said, this is super we can all do a three-layer extension of our model. And so we had four contributions which all do these extensions of uh, linear and nonlinear shallow models specifically designed for three-layer systems. Now, this essentially describes large-scale shallow liquid metal batteries. This is an, an essential point. And we had debates at the time whether batteries were going to be large scale and shallow or whether they were going to be small and non-shallow. Um, actually, probably we will just not have metal pad roll sensibility at all. But we didn't know that at that time. So let me, this brings me to the DNS of metal pad roll instability. And the truth is that we cannot simulate large scale cells. We need turbulence models or shallow models. This is the real, the real bare truth we don't read that in the literature on uh, reduction cells, but we cannot simulate in DNS large-scale cells. It's impossible. In DNS, we can do Reynolds 10 to the fourth maximally. So this is why 
all DNS were done in small centimeter scales. So, so this was first done by Norbert in uh, 2017 for a magnesium antimony cell using a, a multiphase MHD. And this was then a follow-up study, uh, which was more parametric, very in-depth, uh, and asked what is the non-dimensional parameter that controls the instability. Is it the same one as in the two layers? It demonstrates also that this instability can lead to an electrolyte rupture. So this is, in a, is a snapshot from uh, that study where you see a rotating wave, mainly on the upper interface. And so magnesium antimonic batteries, they behave much as two layer systems simply because they have the property that the density difference on the, on the between the top and the middle layer is very low, whereas the density difference between the salt and the alloy is very big. Remember, liquid metal batteries, they have three different densities that need to be stably stratified. So one, two E interface is very easily deformed, but the two thirds interface is very little deformed. So, well, the shallow theory instability, uh, theory for uh, instability, we could try it out and gives a typical instability criterion in terms of a non-dimensional number beta has to be bigger than some critical beta. And then it's going to be metal pad raw and stable. But I thought, why should that criterion work? this cell is not shallow, not at all. So uh, we focused on that because we had that, but in fact, um, all the theories are not adapted to this type of situation. So we could have other types of batteries, not, also ma not only magnesium antimony batteries, and this was considered by uh, Gerrit, who did a, a nice study in GFM on this uh, three layer system. So he found a three layer gravity wave dispersion discussed many physical things about it. When are the waves going to be dominated by just two layers? So he found that uh, there's a coupling parameter, which is mainly the, diff the ratio of the density jumps. It's a bit more complex in reality, but mainly that. And he did also new simulations on metal pad roll. And what was extremely welcome here was a liquid metal battery physical property table. So you need to see the work that is behind that you need to go and read all the old liquid metal battery literature to find these numbers. And once you have this type of table, other people will use it. And this is what happened also. Um, we were very happy to read off at least some parameters. We don't have conductivity, we don't have viscosity, but we know approximately the values. But these values were not known. So um, what did Garrett do in his simulations? So in, he took the liberty to say, Let's don't talk about one particular battery and, and uh, let's do a more fundamental study. He varied the top layer density and kept the density of the two other layers constant. He also varied the applied current and imposed a, a fixed magnetic field of some 10 millitesla. Um, and this is what you get. Um, actually, um, as you vary this coupling parameter or the inverse of it, you can get different modes. You can have uh, slow modes, which are anti-symmetrical rotating waves with different amplitude ratios, of course, depending on this parameter. But you can also have symmetrical in-phase deformations, and this occurs in this region where this number is close to one. So when you see that, as a physicist, you, say you just want to understand why. And this was a, a big motivation for me. Um, so you could say, well, do some uh, linear instability theory, but the cells we simulate in DNS are non-shallow and small. There is viscous dissipation, magnetic dissipation, because the fields are much bigger in these small cells. We cannot use a shallow theory to design for large-scale cells. If you want to understand quantitatively what is going on in these simulations, we need a different stability model, and that's what we designed. So in this article, we made a theory for two-layer systems because we want to start with two before doing three. Um, it's a perturbative expansion on gravity waves. It's a perturbation theory. It, has, it creates explicit formulas for inviscid growth rate, damping, uh, viscous and magnetic. And we numerically validate this theory with DNS. So this is a first timer in, uh, in metal bad roll theory. Uh, we didn't have that before, but it's for small cells. We also did some, uh, Gerrit also did some hydrodynamical ex ter experiments to test the viscous damping formula. Now. The thing is, if we apply this two-layer theory to magnesium antimony simulations, it actually works quite well. So we have this growth rate comparison, 
um, it's not without adjustable parameters, just the same, boom, it follows exactly the numerical points. We were very happy about that. But it's also normal because the, the bottom doesn't move, it's at rest. So the theory, the three layer theory, using the same approach is possible, but after 100 pages of Bessel functions, I needed a break <laughs> there. So the DNS of metal pad rolls and stability was also done in cuboids. Um, and uh, this is a, a, a work by um, uh, um, uh, Oleg. No, I will not present this uh, in detail, but this is like uh, uh, the extension and we now have that. We now finally have, uh, I found a, a student that likes Bessel functions and he, uh, he, he calculated everything in the same in three layers, it's a huge amount of work. But we have a theory that also explains the, 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 the observations of Garrett. Now, um, now my conclusion on metal pad roll instability, I will have to accelerate a bit. Oh, sorry. Now, well, if we would be able to make large scale batteries, we would have metal pad roll instability. It's much or more or less the same physics. We can do simulations of small cells. Um, it's incredibly difficult because you need to resolve Stokes layers, which are incredibly thin and this creates, creates uh, di di demands a huge amount of resolution. And we can understand them theoretically, but what is still lacking is like a nonlinear theory for what is a wave magnitude. We don't have that. We know when they are there, we have all kinds of stability criteria, but we still don't have, even in this fundamental, for a fundamental point of view, we don't have like weekly nonlinear theories that estimate wave amplitudes. <coughs> now, electrovoltaic flow, um, what is electrovoltaic flow? We had a bit about that yesterday in several talks. So um, Nobra did the first simulation in that sense. Um, when you have, um, it, it's just as the result of the fact that, the Lorentz, that there is a base state Lorentz force that you cannot compensate with a pressure gradient. And so you create flow and this looks like jets when you don't have a vertical external field. But when you have a small vertical external field, it will all start to circulate because Lorentz force will be azimuthal. Now, this is, there's a big literature on this subject. There's a book by Valdis, um, and there's a book also by Peter. Um, and now, this brings me to this topic, um, mixing of the alloy. So I'll probably uh, accelerate well to the end of my uh, talk. But this was a, this was a really important uh, article because we never knew about this problem <laughs> in, uh, in our community. Um, so mixing. Why? Well, uh, why, why, why is it interesting? Well, when you discharge a battery, you put lithium into the alloy and this needs to diffuse. But if you make a big current, you will have a lot of lithium there and it diffuses very slowly. So you will create like a, a blockage. And if you combine lithium with lithium, you get zero voltage. So we call this over potentials and it looks like a traffic jam. So um, now um, well how can we avoid them? Well, we just say, okay, let's do some flows in the alloy layer and mix the light this light material to the bulk. Now, um, this was actually the, 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 the setup uh, that was studied and it motivated um, it, uh, it was a setup that was uh, that create combined convection and electrovoltaic flow, and well, it measured. It gave us an idea about the typical time scale for flows uh, for mixing inside these systems. So, this um, this 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 created a, a whole number of studies uh, that were dedicated to this setup. So I will have to skip it because I still want to talk about it a bit about solid to convection, but. We had many debates about which one is going to be able to mix, but we never simulated mixing. We just compared flow magnitudes. So, see, obviously much two slides. Voila. Now, I, I would like to use my uh, last moment um, to, to talk about these salutal effects. What are these salutal effects? Uh, well, let us recall what is happening during shards so you all have this, this, this blockage which is created, but lithium is also light, much lighter than lead. And so the density of the alloys changes 
locally and much. So this is like a phase state diagram for lead lithium alloys. And you can see as you discharge, you will walk down this line and you can easily have 30,000 kilograms per meter squared cubed uh, as a difference, huge. So it changes a lot. And solid fuel buoyancy tanks are just huge and they will obviously influence mixing. Try to mix air inside water. You will see you will need a pretty strong flow. So, and during charge, we have right the opposite. You will all get all the light material out, it will become heavy and it will be dropping down. So we, this was an important turnover because we all ignored that the bottom layer could change density. Now, this requires a new uh, model to be developed uh, with, with mass transfer in it. And uh, this is what Paolo did. And this is an example of what you can get as flows. Um, you can get no flow during charge, a very light buoyant layer. And during charge, a very heavy layer that will immediately create convection. So you get, the, you, you get mixing for free and during charge, but you have a very strong price to pay. You will need to ha have a big flow to, to mix this light layer on the top. So I will have to uh, uh, move on towards my conclusion to remain in time. But uh, we did many studies on this topic. For example, this is a, uh, this is a convection uh, that was uh, uh, simulated by Sabrina Bena during her Master II internship. And she will talk more about this solid fuel buoyancy effect in her talk. What I found interesting was this type of reasoning physically. Can we understand what is necessary to mix so and all the same physics of like you have a, a light particle, a heavy bulk flow that scratches into something light. Can we estimate the, the minimal velocity that is necessary to, to, to do, to, to, to pierce through the certification, to blend in the light material? So we did the, the physical analysis and I really enjoyed that. And um, like at the end, the topic was, can we mix the alloy? We could mix the alloy. And this is a very huge simulation that was done by Caroline. This is uh, called the Electrovortex Blender. Um, it had been done previously by uh, Norbert, or, but we made a huge simulation of, uh, of this uh, topic. And so you can see in blue, this is the alloy, uh, the, the alloy concentration. So the conclusion about this solute buoyancy and mass transfer pro problem is that the alloy is not constant density. Don't ignore that. Solid fuel buoyancy effects are huge and you will create a convective flow during charge and, uh, and you will create a blockage, a very buoyant, almost air above water layer during charge. So mixing is a real <laughs> issue there. So we can theoretically model what, and this is nice physics in my view. It's simple to understand actually. Um, and this is also something real. Finally, we modeled something real that is going on in small cells. We didn't need large scales. So and uh, what now? So what now? Um, well, um, oh, I will have to leave. What now? Well, a battery, it's not just three resistive layers of liquid. Still, we do use Ohm's law everywhere. We do MHD. But a battery is a device that creates a potential difference that results in a current. So where does this potential difference come from? Well, you have potential jumps on the interfaces, mainly on the bottom interface. And this is like, a, you can see a battery that is discharging like a roller coaster with a very steep ascent and then a very weak downwards run. And then you go back through the potential jump and you're back up. So this is a battery. This is a system that creates its own current. It's not just a resistor. And we ignored that too. So this is due to a double layer that is created near the interface. And this is not so simple physics. Since we are here at the workshop, I've been demanding several people explain me the double layer physically. What is going on? If for us, it's really difficult to see what, wh how it, uh, what, uh, why it that. So probably if you have done chemistry courses for beginners, we would like to know <laughs> what that is and where it comes from. So understanding this double layer and modeling, it is a very different story. So I would say, go and see the posters on this topic. There are several ones, but do revise your electrochemistry class. 
So as a physicist, MAD science, this, uh, we really don't know much about electronic chemistry and modeling seems very complex. So too many, many field, pa many parameters, a lot of thermodynamics. But some of us have the courage to go in that direction and I really uh, congratulate you guys at Britain to do that because when I opened uh, uh, electrochemistry book, I immediately closed it back again. <laughs> so I would say that this continuous electrical potentials and for these simulations, they are probably the future in our simulations. Can we do a complete model? Well, there was an interesting Chinese <laughs> attempt to do that. The people came from uh, electrochemistry, but they were less familiar with MHD. So we need to discuss more as community. They had this strange current, which is just charges that dis displace. But we all know that charges that displace, it's not the way you do that in MHD. You don't have this red term. So all the results in, in this article I don't trust them, but they contain interesting ideas about electrochemistry that we are not familiar with. So I'm pretty sure they will present a better model soon. Now my overall conclusion of flows in liquid metal batteries, we came by the Taylor instability, but have found many other flows. We went from very weak flows to more and more intense flows. Some of the LMB flows, we have been so passionately about them, but they will probably never be relevant in a real battery systems. So, for example, there is no reduction light cell <coughs> LMBs. And I will come back to your citation, don't trust the experts. <laughs> so, in some sense, we all went in that direction because we saw this talk and we were incredibly inspired by it. It created this, but it's not a waste of time. This has learned me many things, uh, in fact. Applied MHD, first of all, it's not boring. It has a nice physics there. Non-dimensionalization is completely without use in liquid metal batteries. You have too much parameters. People still are asking me that when I send an article, oh, you should non-dimensionalize your problem. You have 20 parameters. You can gain four by non-dimensional. You have 16 non-dimensional parameters. Nobody will understand your notation. Nobody will understand your graphs, nobody will read your paper. Whereas you stay dimensionless, dimensional, people can still have a feeling with everything. And it also hides a lot of reality. Like I think really this is a message that I also want to send to the Dynamo community. Put some numbers also, real. Be because it's nice to be able to do simulations, but what are you really simulating? What are we really capable of? And this battery problem was forcing us to do it. We, we also had to be interested more in real material properties. So this is something that I experienced during the publication of one of the articles on solitude buoyancy. I sent it out to PRF and the editor said to me, no, it's not for this journal. Why? Because I started the article by describing the material properties of this alloy. It's essential when you talk about solid tool buoyancy, but people say, ooh, too applied, not interesting. And it's a generality of what we see in uh, fluid mechanics. We are so focused on few number of parameters, but sometimes we need to open up towards real material properties. And as you've seen through my talk, this liquid metal batteries was like a giant lesson on that. Like, it's not constant density. It's even not the potential is depending on the concentration. The concentration is depending on the flow. Uh, you need <laughs> to look in all these chemical book to find material properties. It's much more complex in reality. And this is the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. We have time for one question. So, so I've got a, a slightly uninformed question as, as usual. So w when you started talking about the potential at the end of your talk, yes. all of a sudden I sort of thought, is that how you design the, the liquid alloy? That's how you choose it to make that potential as large as possible? And that's where the basic chemistry comes in? Well, it's of course one of the, one of the criteriums that you want to have a much as large 
possible uh, potential jump, but this really depends on the material choices. And uh, uh, Donald presented us that yesterday, um, mm -hmm. where to ha find these material combinations. Yeah. So the best ones would be lithium, because, uh, because it's very reactive. Yeah. Uh, you will create a huge potentials, and that's what we found in all our, s our mobile devices. Right. But um, we probably cannot use that in large-scale storage devices. You showed you show the, you show the ions going down. Yes. Presumably they only go down. Yes. Yeah, you have a put. It's like chem it's like potential energy. Is there's a spontaneous way the reaction wants to take place once you close the wires, and it it will just go in that direction because you lower chemical potential energy, and uh, if you do that too quickly, you will have losses because you have Joule losses. Internal resistance is simple, but you also have losses because you put too much material in there and you cannot diffuse it either way. So the real potential that you will get, it's not such an easy curve. You yeah. cannot, you can, if you're a like chemistry expert, you probably can say this one is better than this one, but we cannot. So this question is from Manuel, um, and he says, Hi, greetings from Berlin, and thanks for your great overview. My question is, with some knowledge on modeling of electrochemical systems, does dissolved Li in PB form some kind of dispersion, or is it really dissolved in PB in a gas-like manner? In PB? PB. In a ah, okay. Um, no, it's a binary, uh, binary alloy model. Yeah. So. When, when, wh what you say is that the density, total mass density, rho, is rho A plus rho B. Part of the density comes from atoms A, part comes from atoms B. And um, you have three fields then, you have rho, rho A, rho B, but they are not independent. And so as a, as a result, you, you, own, you, take, you have a supplementary equation, which is governing the mass concentration of, uh, the, um, of the, the light element in the alloy. And rho B is just a result of that. So we do use a continuum model to do that. It's not a microscopic model. It's not a gas-like model. It would be like if a gas model means like nexus of two different species in gases, the answer is yes. If it's a microscopic model for gases, I would say no. So I don't really know what the person that asked your question meant, but probably I hope, I hope that I answered this question. The next talk is by Caroline No.